Welcome to The Bill Walton Show, featuring conversations with leaders, entrepreneurs, artists and thinkers. Fresh perspectives on money, culture, politics and human flourishing. Interesting people, interesting things. Welcome to The Bill Walton Show. Uh, I was chairman and CEO of Allied Capital for, well, chairman for 14 years, CEO for 13 years, and during that time, one of our very best businesses uh, was commercial real estate lending. And the architect of that business, uh, John Shure, was also the leader of the business and was also CEO of Allied Capital during, the, during my last year there. We, we, we took it into merger together. Uh, John Shure is the kind of man that lives and breathes commercial real estate. John would go on a vacation to, let's say, Miami Beach. And you get John on the cell phone and you say, John, how's it going? Well, I haven't been to the beach yet. I got to go down to look at this shopping mall down in Key Biscayne because I'm worried about whether the roof is any good and whether it needs repair. And, you know, we got a loan on it and I want to make sure the parking lot's okay as well. So that's John. He lives and breathes it. And so with all the carnage going on in commercial real estate now because of the COVID-19 lockdowns, I got curious about what's happening. How bad is it? Are there investment opportunities? And I got called John. We started talking. And after about five or 10 minutes, I thought, I don't want to, I want to share this with other people. So let's have John on the show to talk about commercial real estate, uh, where we've been, where we are, and where it's going. John? Bill. So <laughs> you it's great, great you to be here. It's like sitting in an investment committee. It is. <laughs> we've had, we had lots of fun over the years on, did. on many things. Talk about, let's, talk, let's talk about what we did together in uh, Allied Capital Commercial and then when we got into the BP's business. Okay. I think that'll help set the stage for how much you know about uh, what's going on now. Okay. Well, I mean, we should probably even go back before when you were a director and, and sure. before you took over. And I came to work for Allied uh, really in the summer of 1990, and I approached them with the idea that it was there was an opportunity to buy loans from the Resolution Trust Corporation and the FDIC and banks and life companies because there was so much distress. And they hired... RTC had taken over all these loans from the banks when the banks went under. Right. Okay. Back in the 80s. And, you know, if you remember in the 80s, you know, we had this huge building boom that was fueled in part by uh, tax regulation and then convincing the SNLs that they had to get into commercial lending when they didn't really know that much about it. And so, you know, we had a large building boom and then ultimately everything collapsed and the government took over. And so like all crashes, it becomes an investment opportunity. Right. And that's where you came in. Right. Exactly right. And, uh, you know, we looked at a whole lot of opportunities back in those days and we started buying loans at a discount on all kinds of commercial property all over the country. And it involved a lot of due diligence. It's similar to today, you had appraisals on a lot of properties, but the appraisals weren't worth very much because, you know, underlying assumptions had dramatically changed. And so, you know, we were a little bit flying blind, but we had to figure out what were, you know, what was good and what was not so good. So we invested in a lot of pools, and then that... The re but I think the important thing that ought to be stressed here is that, and this gets to my joke about you waste, not wasting, spending, your, investing your vacation time. Right. Uh, we didn't have any documentation. We didn't know what we had. So we needed to develop a team of people to go out and look at the properties, talk to the, to the rent roll people or, and, and whatever, to really get to know them firsthand, not just rely on a piece of paper. Right. Right. Well, that's exactly right. And, you know, commercial mortgage documentation was a lot less stringent in those days. So many files had almost no information. And so you're right. We had to develop all the policies and procedures to go figure out whether things were good or not good or whether they were, you know, we thought there was a possibility of making or losing money. And um, so... So we did that, and we were successfully bought a number of pools of loans. And then, as you know, we raised Allied Capital Commercial Corporation in 92. And public company. Public company, and then Business Mortgage Investors in 93, January 93. And those two co-invested in a lot of loans that we bought from the RTC and the FDIC and banks. And then 
you know, similar to today also, back in the 80s, you know, hotel loans became problematic. And, you know, by 1990 or so, you couldn't get a hotel loan anywhere. And I imagine today, if you go out looking for a hotel loan, you're not going to get many takers uh, at any level, either banks or life codes or anybody else. Well, one of the things we're going to figure out is when it becomes investable again. Right. Well, okay. that's, anyway, that's, that's, to be, I, I interrupt. Continue. It's all it's all a function of price, <laughs> yeah. right? And uh, so we started probably in ninety late 93, 94, originating some loans on hotels. Which means making the loans Make, to the hotel. To loan. the hotel. You went from the buying the loans to... Originating. Okay. Right. right. And then, then we expanded out into other property types at the same time. But my point is that, you know, we did hotels because it was the most lucrative opportunity at the, at the time. Now, you had to be very careful, obviously. You wanted to be low, low leverage and have lots of equity and things like that. But, you know, we still moved in that direction. And, um, and then we did a couple of securitizations. You know, we were early on in the commercial mortgage Secur back Securitizations where you bundle a bunch of loans and sell them as a bond. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, we did one in 1995 and then another one in 98. Yeah. And those two totaled, I don't know, $350 million or so roughly in, in bonds. And, and we held a lot of the su subordinate bonds. And then, you know, you came... You came in 96, I Late guess. 96, Late yeah. Late 96, you came in, and <laughs> you and I sat down. <laughs> well, we had five separate public companies. The right. first thing I did to you is I said, John, we can merge your company into the four other companies. That's true. That's true. But we did double our market cap. We did. It worked out, and we had really good access to capital because we did. of that. We did. And at the time, you know, certainly I was looking at both sides of that, thinking, okay, well, wait a minute, am I better off here? Well, you're CEO of your own public company, right. and I'm saying, gee, now you can become an executive vice president. Right. <laughs> uh, but in retrospect, it gave us, you're right, it doubled our market cap, but it gave, it gave us a much better access to capital, ultimately, yeah. which helped us immensely in the long run. And, um, you know, Bill, you and I had different skills in a lot of ways and it gave me the opportunity to work much more closely with you i felt like i grew substantially during that well i did too okay <laughs> so that was it was mutual but yeah. i want to jump in to where i want to get into today um, yeah. and i think the thing that gives you such a great view and the, all these deals came through our investment committee was when we got into what they call the bp's business which is where you buy subordinated debt in a, in, a, in a financing, and it, it's bundled together, and it's put together in a bond. Actually, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm going to let you describe <laughs> it. It's, it's been 10 years. <laughs> bring, uh, bring, bring me up well, to so date. You, you know, you take the, a, a pool of mortgages, right, and you take the cash flows from those mortgages, and, you know, you peel, peel them off, let's say, so that you know, the first cash flows go to the senior bonds, which would be the AAA, and then they filter down, you know, sort of like taking a bucket of water and filling up various glasses until you get to the end. So we, we, we and this was as a result of the debt crisis in 98, when all of a sudden the capital markets froze up, there was no more money for uh, people buying B pieces, anybody who was putting commercial mortgage loans on, on repo facilities, repurchase agreements. So, so they would... So they, you took us into this business. Yes. And we ended up dominating it. At one point, you were known as the king of the B-piece industry. Well, I don't know about that. But well, I, I, was, I, was I, I remember that. You were a big deal. I was deal. in the royal court, And we, we, we <laughs> underwrote over 7,500 loans yes. that had $55 billion face value. And for all types of commercial property, and we did 1.8 billion over what, what six years. Yeah. And then, and so as a consequence, you and me, as part of the investment committee, we saw basically every single piece of commercial real estate loan being underwritten during that period. So we, we did. Got a great overview of the whole hotel, office, retail, multifamily, industrial. You know, the whole, the whole, the whole list. We did. And so 
But we did do something pretty smart, which was in 2005. We sold, sold our <laughs> entire portfolio. Which was two years before the whole thing blew up. Yeah, yeah. Now, I will say that the people who bought it resecuritized our entire portfolio and got most of their money back. So, you know, they could have... For us, that would have been another well, you, you and I had long discussions we, about we, whether we, or not to sell that portfolio. We, we did, so you get the last word. They I, made no, money. No, no. <laughs> Listen, it was a great move. It was a great we, move, we got clearly, out of clearly, because, uh, you know, who knows if the securitization would have held, you know, that market would have held up when we were trying to do it, or, and we got a great price. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> well done. Yeah, uh, yeah. So let's come up to today. I mean, we've got, we're six months into the lockdowns catastrophic impact on commercial real estate categories are or though been affected differently we get single family which is not so much affected industrial medical storage apartment student housing senior housing you know but then it starts getting really ugly when you start moving into office and hotels and malls and that sort of thing so how do you want to go at this what piece do you want to start well with? we you know we could start on you know, let's talk about hospitality since we were talking about hotel loans. Okay, let's go there. And, um, you know, the, the thing with hotel loans is you're renting, you're renting a room every, every night. So when all this started, you know, hotel revenues basically shut down. And, um, you know, I would say probably most of the hotels in the country couldn't cover their operating expenses, let alone produce any net operating income. And, you know, supposedly it's come back a little bit, but it's still, I don't know, 70% below or 70 to 80% below where it was before. Um, so have all hotels been hit hit in the same way? Is, per, is there is there, is there regional differences? Uh, are there property type differences? Cl cl What's, clearly, who, who's clearly. Getting killed? I mean, if you think about it, the biggest segment of the hotel market is Las Vegas, and Las Vegas, you know, survived based on these huge conventions that would go there, and there haven't been any conventions. So mm -hmm. all of those hotel rooms are sitting partially used and. Uh, there's still operating expenses accruing to all of those owners. So that's a tough piece of the market. And then you think about airport hotels, which, you know, not many people go into airports, certainly not business travelers. So those people who stayed in all those hotels, you know, those hotels, you know, they, that may take a long time to come back. And it may take a long time to come back. You know, Las Vegas itself may take a long time. And then you think of Orlando, um, you know, which Disney, Disney, Disney yeah. and Universal, and all of those hotels. So, so who's going to who's who's getting hurt here? Because ultimately, you know, when you think about people maybe watching, listening to this, you own stocks. I hope you don't own a lot of stocks in hotel companies right now, but they might come back. They so might, it come might back. be a good time yeah. to own it. And then there are all the all the entities that own the debt. And, right, and and they're they're underwater. Presumably, the hotels are worth a lot less than the debt. Who well, owns the, who owns that debt? So, so there's a fair amount of debt in the CMBS market, commercial mortgage-backed securities. Securities, and if you look at just that market itself, roughly, uh, I don't know, twenty or twenty-five percent, let's say, of the hotels are probably on some sort of in, in special servicing. Let's say. And then there's probably another, you know, 40 or 50 percent that are on a watch list. So about 70 percent, roughly, is what people are thinking are of hotel loans are on some sort of potential, you know, default or watch list. Our euphemism is special servicing. Special servicing, exactly. <laughs> so Which means you can't pay us back, and we got to talk. <laughs> right, right. And you know, our, you know, we had. Our special servicing platform that we also sold when we sold the portfolio, and we yeah. sold it for very little, mm -hmm. because in you know prior to two thousand seven or eight, there wasn't much going on. No, and yeah. special servicing hardly made ever made any money. You know, it's a very labor intensive business working out loans, and um, but you know our old special servicing platform CW Capital which is located here in Bethesda I guess soon to be DC and 
uh, run by uh, Dave Iannarone as the chairman who he's great. worked for us. He's great. And yeah, Jim he's... Shevlin's the president. And Jim worked for you. And are they pu- are they public? Uh, they're not. That's they're privately owned by Fortress. Oh. Okay. Yeah. So who? Which... Anyway, yeah. those are good people. So. Yeah, yeah. But um, so you know they're. I think initially they had like $18 billion worth of requests for forbearance just across their portfolio when the, this whole crisis started. Um, you're watching The Bill Walton Show, and I'm here with John Shure, my, my real estate, commercial real estate guru, and we're talking about something, an arcane term, special servicing, which is a business which was not a very good business when real estate loans were doing uh, uh, well, but now that they're not doing well, special servicing is where all the action is. Right. Working out bad <laughs> working loans. Working out bad loans. So right. CW is doing but that. But it's just getting it's just getting started because you've got a couple of things happening. One, you know, there's been fairly generous forbearance agreements offered. And then the second thing is, you know, there are restrictions on foreclosures in some states. And, you know, on the multifamily side there's eviction restrictions and so, you know, you, you know, there's a lot of problems that are sort of building up that people are hoping get fixed, and, you know, they may or may not get fixed. So but most of the projections for hotels is that uh, are not, not, you know, I don't, nobody, nobody knows, but it, 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 you got to assume people are going to be traveling less, or maybe yeah. not. I mean, yeah, they, yeah. I, I mean, you know, I, I think this is when I said in the beginning, this is similar to, you know, early 90s, right? When you had a lot of hotels and lenders didn't want to touch them and you didn't know how they were going to do. Ultimately, you know, I think the hotel market comes back, but there'll be pockets of it that may not be quite the same. I mean, well, is it going to be the, the vacation traveler may come back? But the business traveler probably won't. I mean, do we that, think this? Yeah. Do we, do we think I, I think there's going to be a permanent change in the way people do business. And everybody's gotten used to Zoom, right? And it's pretty nice to just, you know, get out of the shower, get go to your living room, you know, all ready to go, and get in front of the camera, and not have to get a, go to the airport, right? Or, but no, I I would agree with you. And so if, if there's a permanent change and you have less business travel, so all the hotels that were built around airports, maybe they don't do so well. Okay. You know, do people ultimately want to go to conferences less, like the big events in Las Vegas and Orlando and some of the other big conference towns? Maybe. Maybe they don't want to go to those quite as, oh. as much. And so maybe those things are overbuilt and the rates are going to have to be lower. Uh, and the returns on equity. But, you know, the other thing is, is when you look at the CMBS portfolio, I think Moody's did a study recently. They're looking at sort of appraisal reduction potentials for hotels. And, you know, it's north of, you know, between 25 and 30 percent, let's say, already. So you're going to have you're going to have a reduction in the value, certainly, of hotels for some period of time. And if you think about it, all the people that, if you've got a hotel loan, and let's say it's, who knows, you know, for ease of calculation, let's say it's $100 million, and you had a $70 million loan on it, and all of a sudden the property is worth $70 million, and it's a non-recourse loan, are you going to continue to put money into it? Mm, mm, probably not. No. You're just going to yeah. say, okay, I'll, Mr. Lender, I'll give you my, give you the keys, or I'll give you the property back. So there may be a lot of deed and lose happening in the hotel But uh, in terms of who's feeling the pain from this, most of the hotels are owned, most people, like a branded hotel like a Hyatt or a Marriott or Hilton or something like that. They're not owned by the hotel chain. No. They're managed by it. Right. So you've got a group of local investors, most of them very high net worth, and this is a part of their portfolio. Right. So they're not going to like it, but it's just one of the, things that go with the territory. Right. So we're not talking... Uh, uh, what I'm looking for is sort of ca- some cataclysmic outcome. I d- I'm not looking for it. I'm just trying to probe to see what that's happening. I don't see it happening. I just think this is going to be repricing. Right. Yeah, no, I agree with you. Per- I mean, on the hotel side, certainly if you 
uh, own, a, you know, if all your net worth is tied up in hotel equity, it's going to be really painful. Well, then you weren't thinking. Right. But but if it's spread out among, I mean, between that and a lot of other things, then... Which is where I think most the investors are. Yeah, in this kind yeah, of yeah. You, you, would, you would think so. Because most of the guys we dealt with were, this was a part of their... Right. Everything right. else. Right. So, uh, any final word on hotel before we get to? Uh, I want to get into. I want to get into office and retail. Okay. Be, All right. Anything um, else on? Uh, no, uh, not on hotels. I mean, I do think most of them are going to come back and they'll be repriced and. Um, you, you know, know. Yeah, I should. Add, we're talking like. I mean, this is one of the brutal realities of the capital markets. Is there's this constant repricing of assets. That's right. There are booms and there crashes. Booms and there crashes. This just absolutely. Uh, kind of goes with the territory if you're an investor or a lender. Right, right, right. Uh, office. Office, okay. And what are the <laughs> occupancy rates in Manhattan? Well, you know, there's a, new, got, there's, the a new, there's a new metric, right, which is, you know, it used to be you look at percent leased or whatever, and now it's percent occupied. But, you know, nationally, I think that occupancy rate's around 25% that people... You know, measured by who's going into the office. Yeah, who's going into the office. And in Manhattan, they say, you know, 10, 12 percent. I've heard 10. Yeah, It 10. could be 12. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, that leaves a huge hole in, in the infrastructure that was there to, to take care of all of the office users, all the little restaurants, the shops. So what's the, happening in suburban New York? So if you are there, our offices in Westchester now beginning to see people wanting to be there because they're closer to ha their house, or what's the? Well, you, you know, I think you're seeing the same thing that you're seeing in the residential housing market, right? People are looking to move out into the suburbs. What is it? I saw uh, car uh, used car prices are up 10 percent, which is just off the charts. It's because everybody wants a car and they want to be able to commute into work or and buy gas prices are low. And gas prices are low. Uh, somebody else said, you know, it used to be a, a while ago, you look at suburban office, and it was always had a higher vacancy rate than downtown <coughs> office. And now, all of a sudden, suburban office occupancy rates are increasing. Um, you know, another anecdotal thing I heard the other day it used to be that there were old uh, single-story office parks that, you know, might not have been doing so well. And now people want to lease those things quickly because it's great. Their workers can drive in. It's much more spacious and uh, inexpensive. You know, the one thing that is going to come out of all of this, Bill, is you know, if you think of where rents were in Manhattan, let's say, or San Francisco, if they were, you know, $80 a square foot or a hundred dollars a square foot or depending on where you were or more. But, you know, if all of a sudden your rent, you know, you can rent space for $20 or $30 a square foot or something like that. And, you know, the other piece of that is, you know, what percent of your workers are going to come back to work on a full-time basis. And you and I talked about this many times over the years <coughs> when we had multiple offices around the country and how hard it was to keep the cult, our culture, our credit Well, that culture. was, we've talked about that. That was one of, I don't, in hindsight, I think it was a bad decision to have multiple offices because you can't keep the credit culture that you have when you just got one space that people can work in. Right. And I think we've adapted to this virtual Zoom way of doing business, but I don't know... <clears throat> I don't know how sustainable that is. I don't know. I don't know either. I think I think people have got to touch and feel and communicate, and you read people that you in a, in a way in person that you don't read them if they're if you're looking at them on Zoom. Right. I, you know, I agree with you. But does that mean you have to come into the office five days a week? No. No. It's probably you can get by with less. One a day. Yeah. Something yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I forgot something on hotels. I wanted to sort of circle back just because this is so interesting. Occupancy rate hotels are, are have stayed plummeted depending on the number, yet hotel occupancy in one country has been going up straight through this whole COVID thing. 
Isn't that shocking? And which country could that possibly be, Bill? I'm, 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 leaving, I'm leaving that to you. China. I, I mean, I pulled this slide, but I don't know that I believe anything that comes out of China. But, you know, this showed that their occupancy in September, you know, was back up to where it was in September of 2019. And it had dropped. It's not about 67 percent, and it, yeah. at the beginning of this, it was, what, 10 percent? Yeah, and it's all the way back up, which just, you know, it's hard to believe, isn't it? I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I think we're outside of our area of expertise well, I agree. here. We, I agree. We, I agree. I agree but but I, I, it's really, that, that's, that's a number that really strikes me as being strange. Yeah, very strange, but... But in any event, uh, it was one that well, we had to talk about. So, um, so office, you know, in the face of all of that, right? You, you know, you got to say to yourself, okay, how long does it take cities like New York and San Francisco, Chicago to come back? Because not only, you know, there's been multiple effects from COVID, and some of it is how locked down these cities were vis-a-vis -vis the suburbs or other parts of the country and um, and how many small businesses that service those office buildings go out of business and aren't there to serve office users so you know do you want to go into the office if there's nothing no place to get lunch if there's no place to do your dry cleaning if there's no place all of those things um, you know, it could take quite a while for all of that to come back. I mean, you know, in, in our lifetimes, you know, we remember New York, you know, in the 70s and 80s. And I think, I mean, you lived in New York. Um, you know, it was a tough place to be. Well, it was tough, but you still had restaurants. That's true. That's true. And you still had museums. Yeah. And you still had all the things that it doesn't have now. Right. Right. We're going to get to that in just a second as okay. so we finish up the, the office piece. Okay, so well, I got one last thing to say about office, too. Which and I is, also want to know when we can start buying office buildings. Yeah. At what price do we? Well, interestingly enough, so um, uh, there's been, as you might guess, there's not much leasing activity around the country for office because people are nervous you know mm -hmm. what, what do they want to do they want to commit to more space someplace i don't think so um but you know in uh march i think amazon bought the old lord and taylor building in new york with and saying you know we're gonna convert this to an office use and oh then, that's interesting so we're wondering what's going to happen to the department stores so that's there's there's one use because if and if you think about it you know you have this wide open space that works well for it's a great it's, atrium space. It, it is a great atrium space and there's another building in new york where there was a lease signed in august substantial amount of square footage and it was for another tech company to do something similar so the tech companies may already be thinking hey this is this is a great opportunity for us we can pick up space ultimately young people you know like to be near you know in these city centers Maybe they're not there every, maybe they don't live there, maybe they're only there a few days a week. But, um, and then, you know, as you look around the country, you know, there's been a, um, a building in um, Charlotte that re recently sold. Uh, but, you know, Charlotte's a, a market that you could almost say it's almost suburban somewhat in, a, in the way that it works as opposed to being a big city like New York or Chicago or whatever. You know, there's been a building sold in, in Miami. Um, I'm in a fund in Florida and, you know, we bought a building in West Palm Beach. But, um, and, you know, there's one for sale that we're looking at right now. And the metrics are still very good, even if the occupancy, occupancy is 25%, but the, you know, it's rented to 98%. But it's in a great location there's been a ton of movement towards the you know in the southeast so some of it's jurisdictional and well, geographic but the, that's i guess what effect did the stimulus bill have, this, have the stimulus bills had on all this because it's it seems to me that they've masked a lot of pain right and we've shipped trillions of dollars to people and everybody's getting their piece of it every you know, a lot of small businesses nonprofits, they've all gotten a cushion 
of, of money to pay things, and they're paying rent or whatever they're, they're paying, but, it, but that money it's is going to run out. <laughs> it's run out. That's and right. We're arguing as we speak about whether there's going to be another one. And right. Once that money runs out, do we hit a cliff? You know, I mean, it could be. It could be because all of a sudden people that, you know, delinquency rates go up more, some yeah. of these tenants can't pay the rent, um, you know, that the, you know, if you think of the PPP loans, I mean, those extended across a lot of small businesses that, yeah, you're right, they can't pay the rent and the landlords won't get it. And then the. So, in a way, we really can't. Oh, you're watching the Bill Walton Show. I'm here with John Shore, and we're talking about the effect of the stimulus on the commercial real estate market, the stimulus bills, the trillions of dollars, and uh, what might happen when that runs out. Um, I don't think anybody really knows the answer, but. Uh, we're going to try to figure it out. Right. Okay. The uh, we were talking about office. Yeah. Before, but um, you know, again, I think it'll be similar. You know, there'll be a repricing of certain assets in certain locations. Maybe it's not as dramatic as the, as the hotel, but there'll still be a repricing. You know, some suburban assets will become much more attractive, and prices will be higher, and some urban assets but, will be less. But, but you probably know this as well as anyone that real estate values and cash flows are really driven by by, by social changes right. and and you know fashion really and as the big you know the what the number of department stores has decreased from ten percent of retail sales to like two one percent or two yeah, percent yeah, something yeah. like that yeah. and that that's that's all changed so. I guess we're trying to chase what the social, what the what the trends in society are going to be. Is to that's really going to tell you where you want to be in real estate. That's right, that's right. And you know, the one thing that we've seen over many years is that, or at least the last thirty years, is that you know people like to be near cities if if they're working properly. They like to be near city centers. I mean, just the the city center concept. If if you think about that, that's been highly Still. successful in developing a lot of even communities, even if it's a you know city centers historically. But city centers post, and we're talking about social costs. City centers post uh, uh, Black Lives Matter occupying inner cities. You go to downtown D.C. now. You look around the Hay Adams. And that whole neighborhood in there—it's all boarded up. Yeah, it's all graffiti, scary, all sorts of people there. That that part of the center city is not seductive. No, no, certainly not. So, so unless so, we reclaim that, then this is going to be harder to see that you want to be downtown at your office. Well, you know, think about New York. You know, your experience in New York in the '70s. As you I said, loved New York, even in the '70s. In the '70s, <laughs> but but it it wasn't that safe. It wasn't that clean. Uh, maybe it didn't matter because you were so young. I was young. It was fine. <laughs> but, it seemed but, okay to me. <laughs> but, but, you know, it, it really took, what, a decade or almost two to get New York really yeah. going again. Yeah. And D.C., we had the same thing in the 90s. You know, it became unattractive. That 14th Street was, you couldn't even, yeah. Yeah, you know, no, it wasn't, wasn't safe. It wasn't, you know, that well run. So, you know, how these cities react to this is going to play a huge difference on how they recover. I mean, if you're a small business trying to get started in New York or D.C. again, if you could go someplace and get one permit or one license that does everything you need to do and you don't have to go to six or ten different places to start your business, you know, that might make it easier if there's, you know, if there's lending programs to help, yeah. help these small businesses get going, that'll go a long So way. if you want to track this, you want to track the lease expiration schedules. Right. So as these leases, occupancies way down, but they're still fully leased. Right. And they come up, that's the moment of truth. That's the moment of truth. And the thing is, in the office, it's spread out over a number of years. So, you know, it'll be years before we see the full effects of this. Yeah. And, you know, which, which, if you think about that, it gives some of these municipalities an opportunity to, you know, if they can act quickly and fix things, then 
make it desirable for people to come back. Maybe some I want to shift. I want to shift to retail um, malls and and uh, whatever, which is also Manhattan. I mean, and restaurants and that whole thing. Yeah. I mean, we we talk about closing restaurants. Well, the first order effect is it crushes the real estate or the restaurant owner, but the but the the immediate effect is you get the person that owns the property that doesn't have anybody in there can rent it, and you can see that. In, in D.C., Wisconsin Avenue, things, you know, every week Sarah comes back and says, well, this one's shut down or that one's shut down. Right. I mean, that seems to be a rolling problem. Right. And there's something like 40 percent of the restaurants in Manhattan that people don't think are coming back. You have 40 or 50 or more. So, percent. yeah. As a, so, so, tell me about it. So, that. we're talking about, re, you know, I mean, there's two components here, really, retail, retail itself, right? Yeah. which includes malls, but restaurants. And then, um, you know, the whole, uh, I don't know if you want to call it the Amazon phenomenon or the uh, order online or, mm -hmm. or click and deliver phenomenon or whatever it is. But, you know, we've, first off, as you well know, we've been way over retailed. We have the highest retail per square footed or square footage yeah, per what are those person. numbers you it's like 24 percent in america uh, 24 got... square feet per person in the u.s so versus... we've all got our own four foot by six foot uh we, we, we do and then if you look at the rest of the world you know the next is canada at like 16 percent oh, and 16 th feet 16 feet sorry and then it and then it drops down to you know, most of the rest of the world is under 10 or under 5. And we have, you know, so we've been over-retailed for a long time. Germany's 2.3 square foot okay, for sorry. people. Those See, Germans are not going to let no, you. No. <laughs> no, but they didn't build all the shopping centers and things that we did either. Um, but so so this, this has increased, you know, we were going towards click and deliver anyway, but this has dramatically increased that. So a lot of that retail has to get repurposed. And maybe it becomes, you know, last mile delivery points for various uh, retailers. Some of it converts to quasi-industrial or something like that. But you well, know. what happened with a lot of these retail spaces, though, was as people went to buying thing, things from small retail shops and went to Walmart to buy stuff from China. Right. Those spaces didn't go empty. They got started fill, filling up by service businesses, gyms, salons, yep. nail parlor, things like that. Yet if you look at where we are now, almost uh, a third, maybe a half of those people can't pay the rent. The beauty salons, the gym fitness, entertainment, all these people that are service businesses, it's the service businesses that are getting clobbered right now. Yes, all those people, it's... You know, it's heartbreaking if you think about what's happening to all of those small businesses because they're all entrepreneurs that had the courage to. It's get heartbreaking. Out. It's yeah. really, it's really. It is, it, and it, there's no focus on it because you look at the stock market. The stock market seem is doing fine. Those are all the large cap companies. Those have not been hit in the same way these small businesses. That's have been right. Hit. And so we've got two, 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 two Americas right now. We've got the big company in America and the small business America. And small business America hadn't recovered, doesn't even show any signs of it. No, no. And, you know, they really have no way to recover without, you know. Either. And even then, especially the clock's ticking on the PPP money because right. that, that's, that's going to run out. That's, that's holding up, so maybe that number ends up being much higher. But, you know, the real challenge on keeping all of these urban areas together even some of the suburban areas, you know, is you have to provide those services for people somehow, some way. And you have to have entrepreneurs that are going to get out and take a chance and work on it. So you got to make it easy for them. You have to, you know, has to be light on regulation in order to help get their businesses going. And then they're going to need capital. And they're probably going to need rent relief. Well, we've had... I think you sent me something. Um, retail closers, the headline is, they face mass extinction. Right. Mass extinction. Well, 
you know, what is it? The highest we've ever had was around 9,000 or something. 9,800 9, in 2019. 2019, and we're projecting the, like 20,000. Yeah, now we're 20,000. Yeah. So, and, you know, who knows where that goes depending on, uh, and then, you know, bankruptcy, as you well know, Fortunately, we didn't have to deal with it all that much, but we certainly did over well, the years. One of the things we didn't do was we stayed away. We, we didn't get into retail. <laughs> no, because it's, it's it, you know Sarah worked for uh, Phil Merrill, who ran Washingtonian Magazine, and he they made a, a fortune on ads from restaurants in in the magazine. Probably still do, but Phil would tell you, "I'll run their ads, but I'm not going to invest in them. <laughs> <laughs> because." <laughs> You know, if you own a piece of real a strip mall or you know commercial real estate, you're renting to a restaurant. You know, it's going to last for what two years, three years for most of them. Yeah. Well, it used to be what is it? it used to be seven years. I think was the average life of a restaurant, but then I think it, it, you're right. It's gone down over the, and who knows what it would be now. So, uh, we're we're running a bit. Of, we're running out of time. Which okay. Is making me <laughs> upset. Let's, let, there, there's an interesting thing about malls with closed anchors. I mean, yeah. malls back in our day was you had Bon Teller, uh, maybe that's not a great example. J.C. Penney. J.C. Penney. <laughs> yeah. Sears. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So the, the rule of thumb is if you've got a mall and you've lost three or more of those big box or those, I don't know what the title is. Of the, yeah, yeah. The bigger yeah. store uh, yeah, tenants. The, the anchors. The anchor tenants. Your probability of staying in business is uh, low. Low. Right, and so there's a lot of those malls that are going to have to be repurposed for something. I think that's an opportunity. I do. For somebody somewhere. I, I do. But right now what I'm worried about as we talk about this is we talk about economic growth. I think we could see a second dip that's coming out of this. As the Well, certainly if we don't get another you know, additional stimulus of something to help these people, all our small business owners in this country, they're the ones that are going to be in real trouble. But do you remember malls, just as long as you went on this topic, and I'm maybe jumping around on you, but uh, we know one of the best deals that we did back in the 90s, well, it was probably late, night, late 90s, and we helped finance a mall in Jacksonville, outside of Jacksonville, Florida, and oh, it was God. failed. That was, what a story that was. Well, it was... You know, this is 650,000 square foot mall and the anchors had gone and, you know, it was 80 percent vacant and it was a disaster. And we helped, you know, we helped a group buy the loan at a discount for like three million dollars or three and a half million dollars. And and, you know, the developer came to us with a plan and the plan was amazing, which was. You know, you had the city of Jacksonville agreed to put in $5 million in equity. They agreed to move in um, a police substation. They leased like 20 or 25,000 square feet for their offices. They put in a transit station. And then ultimately the, um, you know, and this was in an area that had rapidly declined. And, you know, what ultimately happened, then Publix opened one of their first inner city grocery stores in there. The mall became successful. It became kind of a community center where there hadn't been much of a community before. And, you know, we we ended up owning part of the equity and... John, you just, did, you just put in high relief what private equity, what active investors do. And I had a guest on the show who will go unnamed. <laughs> who's written all these essays now about how people in the financial sector add no value to the economy. <laughs> and I think about the hundreds and hundreds of deals that we worked where we, you know, they, they'd gone under, we had to find tenants, we had to find this, we did yeah. that. I mean, we had, uh, we were in the donut business. Uh, remember that? Oh. <laughs> all right, Bill, don't well, ruin we, the conversation. We fixed it. <laughs> Got sick eating donuts. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we were the only customers. That's true. <laughs> Had to do something. Yeah. <laughs> um, a rental, uh, a single fa or not mul multi-family and single-family renting. What's 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 the story there? Uh, you know, there is another interesting one. I mean, you know, delinquencies in multi-family ticked up in um, in September from August. Um, you know, overall, they've probably looked pretty good, but, 
you know, again, you've got the issue where there are eviction restrictions, so you don't know for sure exactly how many of these people are paying, how many people, how many of them are small business owners that can't afford to pay their commercial Same rent thing. either. Yeah. Right. I mean, there could potentially be, you know, fairly substantial. And then think about in New York, you know, uh, New York rents were notoriously high, particularly in nice buildings. And so a lot of young people who in the next five years might have moved out of New York are looking around saying, we're moving out. And, you know, rents are off 20 percent. 10, well, 20 percent. As a former young person in New York, and your daughter is <laughs> yeah, a young we person did too. in New York, uh, Wahoo! I mean, you you can now buy you you can now rent a studio apartment that has 600 square feet for only five thousand dollars. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm exaggerating. No, I know, <laughs> but it's not so good. No. Well, John, uh, let's let's come back in six months and assess okay. and assess where we are because I think it for people who look ahead and don't look backward, I think there will be opportunities. We'll have a much clearer picture then than we do now. We will, for sure. Okay. okay. John Shure, star real estate investor, uh, thank you for joining, my, my great partner, and it's been so much fun. And we'll talk in six months, and you and I will talk before that, but we'll talk with everybody else then. So thanks for watching and listening to The Bill Walton Show. See you soon. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. Want more? click the subscribe button or head over to thebillwaltonshow.com to choose from over 100 episodes. You can also learn more about our guest on our Interesting People page. And send us your comments. We read everyone and your thoughts help us guide the show. If it's easier for you to listen, check out our podcast page and subscribe there. In return, we'll keep you informed about what's true, what's right, and what's next. Thanks for joining.